I am Missy Wallace, and I'm the Executive Director of the National Institute for Faith and Work. And the Institute started about 18 months ago, and it's intended to help individuals, groups, companies, nonprofits think through how faith, the Christian faith in particular, impacts the people's day-to-day -day vocational work. The forum tonight is focused on innovation, as you all know, but before we get started, I want to talk, um, thank Ryan Levins for that incredible artistic display. Um, she originally choreographed that, and she choreographed it. We said, could you try to reveal innovation through a piece of art? And so that is the gift that she provided for us tonight. Um, I want to do a little housekeeping first. We have an event hashtag, NIFW Innovates, up on your screens. We'd love for you to join us um, as we go through the night. If you are captivated by a quote, something someone says, a photograph, want to put it on social media, tag it with um, our hashtag, as well as our handles, which is Nash Faith Work, if you follow us on um, any of the social media. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors tonight. Um, due, the, due to the generosity of a lot of people, this could happen. Um, Mountain Group Partners, Zondervan, which is the publisher of a new Faith and Work Bible. There's a picture of it in your brochure. Covenant Seminary, now with classes in Nashville. Gerard Phillips, Kate and Hancock. Fuel for Good and Christ Presbyterian Church all contributed financially to make this night happen, as well as to make our innovation grants happen, which we'll share with you later. I also want to thank Richard Payne, the founder of The Wine Chap. If you all made it over to the wine area, you noticed that um, wine was being served out of an innovative packaging, and Richard was here to tell you about that. Um, tonight our agenda is that um, first Greg Thompson will be speaking to us, um, then we'll have a panel, and then we're going to have our innovation grant finalist. We're going to show two um, two-minute videos. We have three finalists. We're going to show their two-minute videos. And you all will actually be involved in choosing who is the winner of our innovation grant. Um, text in American Idol style. So it's going to be a fun part of the evening. But first, let me set the context. Um, this is our second annual Faith and Work Forum. And last year we covered um, a variety of topics, which I'll just summarize for you quickly. Um, we covered that all work matters to God. We covered that we are created to work. We are made in the image of God and we're created to work. Um, we covered that work is um, bringing structure out of chaos, just like God did in the creation. Um, that all good work is just that, it's structure out of chaos. And it's all either creation or redemption. We talked about how all workers are on the A-team, that the missionaries and the ministers aren't on a level of work that is doing more for God than the bankers and the landscapers. And we talked about how faith and work, the term, especially in the South, um, is most often associated with either ethics or evangelism. And we talked about how faith and work really is, is much more nuanced and all in all parts of your life. Um, really thinking about shining light on darkness everywhere you go. And so before we get off to talking about what I'm going to call Faith and Work 201 tonight, I wanted to call my friend Thomas Hunter up to say a prayer for us to get the night kicked off. Thomas is the head of community relations for the Nashville Sheriff's Office. He's bivocational. He's also a pastor of the Nehemiah Missionary Baptist Church. And he also is a graduate of one of our main programs, which is a year-long faith and work intensive. So. Let's pray. Good Lord, thank you for bringing us out this evening. Thank you for blessing us with this opportunity to just hang out with you. Watch over us, dear God, as we go through the night and as we hear not only from the panelists, but we hear from you. Bless our panelists as they have been called from science and government and social work and health care. Watch over them as they display your knowledge and the things that you have blessed them with. And watch over this crowd of overseers, crowd of watchers who are going to partake in this knowledge that is going to be given to them. Not let us, don't let us just take this knowledge and use it for nothing. The Lord, let us take this knowledge that we receive tonight and use it in our communities, in our churches, and in our homes. 
May you bless everyone here tonight and the speakers that are going to present. It's in your son Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I forgot to say Thomas is also my good friend. I love Thomas. Um, okay, so let's set some context. I'm going to name some names that in 2003 we had never heard of before. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Uber, Airbnb, Snapchat, Instagram, Pinterest, Fitbit, Spotify, Dropbox, WhatsApp, Nest, Box, Hulu, Jet, and now Bitcoin. So I challenge, is there anyone in here that didn't use at least one of those today? Um, probably not. And so when we talk about innovation, we can go so many places today. Um, Webster's defines innovation as the introduction of something new or a new idea, method, or device. Big business Dictionary.com says it's a deliberate application of information, imagination, and initiative in deriving greater or different values from resources. I love that phrase, greater or different values from resources. If you think about innovation, we have product innovation and we have process innovation. So maybe my iPhone is a product innovation, maybe a new filing system, or even Uber is a process innovation. We have evolutionary innovation, small changes. The iPhone 7 has a better camera. We have revolutionary innovation, completely disruptive, changes the way something's done. We have technological innovation, and we have non-technological innovation. And so how do we kind of pull all this together tonight was a bit of my challenge in thinking through how do we think about innovation. I'm, we're not Google. We can't tell you the best way to do innovation. So what we're really trying to present tonight is what does faith say about innovation? And specifically, what do people that believe in Christ, what does that mean about innovation? So tonight's not a tech conference. It's not a futures conference. It's not a creativity conference but we are gonna talk about all of those. Um, we're gonna talk about the process of creating or improving in new ways. We're gonna talk about that that has both impacts on us personally and systemically. So let's just talk about one product, the iPhone. So if you look up at the screen, um, there is uh, a guy that I follow on Twitter who has incredibly interesting posts every day, but one he had recently was in the last 10 years, these are all the things the iPhone has replaced, from keys to paper clips to fax machines. Um, over the Christmas holiday, I was in Costco um, on the Saturday before Christmas, and the line, if you've been to Costco, you know, you go pay up at the front, the line was all the way back to the meat section. So that was a really long line. So, but while I was in line, I booked a condo for a vacation. I Snapchatted silly photos to my teenage daughter. I logged into a workflow portal to review a marketing image for my work team. I answered a text from a board member. I checked Caring Bridge to see how Sick Friend is doing. I checked my college daughter into her flight at LAX on her way to be in DNA. She had texted me from the final exam. Um, and I checked on ticket sales for this event. I did that all in line at Costco with this. And so what is the impact on that? There's a system impact and there's a personal impact. At the system level, we have to think about how have jobs changed? How is education changing? Have you all ever thought about um, what's happening in all the fax manufacturing plants now? Where are all the fax machine workers? Where do they work now? I haven't seen a fax machine in a while. Um, so there's major job flow changes. There's actually been significant job flow predictions um, that by the year 2034, 54% of jobs will be replaced by artificial intelligence. And while we may think that's okay, that's just the robots in the Amazon factory picking up you know, the book to send to us, actually um, psychologists, um, surgeon and attorneys are predicted to be taken over by artificial intelligence as soon as 2034 by some predictions. So that's a crazy impact to the system. So what's the Christian response to thinking about that? Then there's a personal impact. So how are you dealing with all this change? Are you more productive? Maybe in some senses. But is the improved productivity, the increased social connectedness, and the barrage of information that we're overloaded with now, how is that working out for you? 
I'll tell you that I Googled addiction to my phone over Christmas break. So that's how it's working out for me. And I learned the science that there's this new gray, I, you can turn your screen on grayscale and it lets off left dopamine and supposedly it'll make me not check it as much. And I'll, I'll get back to you on that at the next <laughs> conference. Um, but innovation is a mixed bag. Um, there's a system impact, there's a personal impact. It helps some, it hurts some. For some, we don't know. And what about the less sexy innovation? So we've talked about these, all these neat, sexy, savvy, technological innovations, and maybe one out of 10 of us in here will be part of that type of innovation. But we're all involved with innovation somehow. I was part of a team that helped develop a high school and we took every piece of the high school in the planning year and we said, is this the best way to educate kids? And so there were a couple of places we innovated that don't sound sexy at all, but we did it really differently. And that was, for instance, the science curriculum. Things were paired together to be taught together that typically aren't. The PE curriculum. Um, the curriculum was set up so that the ballerinas don't spend a lot of time stretching in PE. They instead are doing a lot of cardio. And the cross-country runners aren't running in PE. They're doing stretching. So the PE program was set up thinking about who was in the PE program. Um, I worked for a consulting firm, and um, they sent me all over the place um, to go into companies with teams of people. And we would try to fix problems or uh, try to quantify opportunities that could be taken advantage of. And so we were asked to innovate a lot all the time. But interestingly, the innovation that I remember the most wasn't something that I did for the client. It was when a partner at the firm did an analysis and determined that if we would all spend 30% less time in airports, we could be more productive for the clients. So I was like, whoa, I took typically four flights a week because I'd see two clients a week. I was like, whoa, I'm going to miss a lot of flights if you want me to spend 30%. He said, that's okay. I figured it out. You'll miss two out of 10 and you'll still be more productive for the client. So that was an unusual way of thinking about client productivity and serving our clients, but it was an innovation nonetheless. And so the point is that we can all innovate within the ordinary too, and it's the same issues. It helps some, it hurts some. It might not be as um, you know, cool as what's on the screen, um, but we all can be thinking about innovating whether we're unloading a dishwasher or the CEO of a tech firm. And it gets back to what we talked about in Faith and Work 101, which is all good work is either creating or redeeming. And so we're bringing structure out of chaos to create or redeem even when we're innovating. And so we're going to make a few assertions tonight, um, whether we're talking about product innovation, process innovation, with or without technology, we believe that innovation is of God, and that we are image bearers of God, and that God is the ultimate innovator, and that he actually taught us how to innovate because he put his character within us. He innovated in the creative story. Genesis is all about innovation, making something out of nothing. But there, another really way to think about innovation is how he innovated to redeem. His ultimate in innovation was a plan to save a broken people, and he did it by sending God into a human form as a poor immigrant who rose from the dead and walked around with holes in his hands and a hole in his side, and he said, please join me in bringing heaven on earth. And so when you, Webster says a new idea or a new method, I would say that a resurrection is a new method to redeem a broken people. And so because God innovated in that way, it's our job to innovate, but not just innovate, but to steward it responsibly. And to think about how we innovate that loves people, places, and things to life. And so that's what we're here tonight to talk about. So with that, I want to introduce um, Greg Thompson. I've known of Greg for seven or eight years, but I've known Greg personally for about a year and a half. Um, he's worked for a number of years in both faith-based and community development organizations. Um, he now serves as an associate fellow at the um, UVA, at the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture. He's also executive directors of both um, two uh, entities, Thriving Cities and New City Commons. And they are consulting teams that equip civic leaders for the work of nurturing thriving communities. He also has his PhD in civil rights from UVA. So he's such an interesting, and a seminary degree as well. So such an interesting way of thinking about innovation. So I turn it over to you, Greg. Thank you.